On this episode of Star Trek Discovery, we're talking about 403, Choose to Live, right after these mystery sponsors give us some words that slide down our throats. Oh. That one went weird places. Welcome to Star Trek Universe, the podcast where you get to listen in on the continuing Star Trek conversations us two friends have been having since we were six years old. My name's Matthew Carroll. I'm David C. Robertson. So, Dave. How you doing? How you doing, bud? <laughs> I'm sleepy too. and sick. I'm, I'm doing all right. Yeah, same, same. I got a little bit of a cough. And I think it's just, I'm in Las Vegas right now, and it's just the dry air out here, and... I think I got a little bit of a, maybe a cold or something. I can't tell. I don't. Yeah. It's just a little bit of a, like, um, mostly just a little nose congestion or whatever. But on top of that being like super tired from this vacation. Yeah. Uh, and I got, I got into the, um, I got into a hotel room today and just sat and did nine hours of podcasting so far. And now we're starting this one. So how yeah. far, how, how, how far can we go with this thing, man? I don't know how far you want to take it. I don't know how many hours you wanted to make this discussion of this episode. <laughs> uh, we could probably make it at least an hour. If we really wanted yeah. to. Oh, I bet we could. Let's get <clears throat> let's get into it. Um, we got this this this. I I I don't know how you feel. We did a little pre talk. I don't, I'm not sure if you were joking or not, but I loved this episode. Really, I did. I did. I absolutely loved it. This is the episode where uh, Burnham. Breaks off with her mom to go on a mission uh, to see where one of the Kuat Malat soldiers had gone, or look, one of the Kuat Malat nuns uh, had gone, and they find out she's trying to awaken a species, and that's her lost cause, and she'd killed a Starfleet officer, so they have to arrest her, but then they turn her over to the uh, Navarre. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, government. Who, as far as I could tell, you know, they're supposed to be Vulcan and Romulan, but all I've seen are Vulcans. You know, <laughs> well, wasn't it? Is it that the Vulcans and the Romulans have now merged yeah. into one species? I mean, this is how many years later? Yeah, and they just look. Man, you know, here's the thing: I'm uh, I'm an old school Romulan fan. I like the Romulans. I like the Romulans from Enterprise right. Incident. I liked it from you know Balance of Terror. Like. I, and I love the Diane Duane books, you know. So to basically come to this point where the species merged and they just, you know, except for the Kuat Malat, who aren't even all Romulan, <laughs> and don't display, you know, many Romulan traits. Right. They're kind of anti-Romulans, right? right? Like they're, well, they're the, the idea is like that they're, instead of being treacherous, which is like yeah. the Romulan way, they are the absolute candor. Uh, they're, they're, they're a rejection of the Romulan ethos or whatever. Well, somewhat. Like there were, there actually was a great deal of, of honor. And I mean, now that I think about it, candor, and in some of the the Romulans of the Diane Duane books, which I really liked, um, and there was honor among them in the original series. So it's great that they retain that um, because they you're you're right during the TNG era, it had very much become like they're just a bunch of treacherous pieces of shit. Right, but um, well, and I I, th- I think. And I, this may go against the Diane Duane books, which I mean, they're not canon, but <laughs> right. They're not canon, but it seems to me like that, that what they're going for is that like the Romulans all along have been what the Vulcans would be without Ser- uh, Sarek or whatever, uh, like Sarek. Sarek, sorry, without Sarek, like, um, they, they were so dependent on their emotions and the species, uh, has such a bent toward, uh, you know, inflamed emotions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it sort of drove them to this like sort of dark and secretive way that is the, the, their culture is very based in deception, lots of secrets. I mean, that, at least in the Picard series, that's very much even still the way I just read, um, read one of the Picard books and they go to a Romulan homeworld during the evacuation and they go into all this detail about how their culture is steeped in deception. Like just to get mm-hmm. into someone's house, you have to like solve riddles to get through because they're hiding their house. Um, it is this whole thing. 
so, so right. it, it may go against what those other, those previous books, but it seems like the canon they're going with is that the Romulans are that, and that now after hundreds of years and reacclimation and, uh, you know, into the Vulcan, um, you know, the destruction of their world, their reacclimation into Vulcan, uh, fusing of the cultures, they've it, it invited some of that Serac, uh, teachings, and now they're mm-hmm. a little less, uh, less passionate in the same way and less deceptive. Yeah. You know, I, I just, it, it feels like Navarre, it, it feels like the Kuat and Malata are like separate somehow from Navarre in a way, which I like that this episode solidified that a little bit, that they're like solidified that they, they are connected. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're connected. I think they're just like a subculture within the Navarre culture, right? Yeah. But, you know, at the same time, it also kind of solidified that, you know, well, that's just those assassin nuns. Everybody else just became Vulcan. Right. <laughs> it could just be that this, this area that we were, we saw this episode, this council was the scientific council and it could be like some lingering racism and like the, Vulcans were known like galaxy wide for their like scientific achievement. Mm-hmm. Maybe, uh, maybe they maintain that. And there's a little bit of racism that like keeps, not, not necessarily keeps Romulans out, but maybe Romulans who do come into the scientific order have to sort of conform a little bit to the Vulcan way of things and the logic of science, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I think about, uh, reunification with the little kid trying to learn the Vulcan ways. And being intrigued by the teachings of Serac, and uh, and I'm I'm sure it was outlawed on Romulus for centuries. Right. So you know, I'm sure that you know a lot of the scientists, even the, the Romulan scientists, can with the with access to the uh, the teachings of Serac can say, oh well, this is clearly a, a superior way. <laughs> Check it out. We can go into a trance. And figure out, uh, shit that a dude from Starfleet already told us. And. (laughs) Yeah, you know, the thing that I, I I hear what you're saying about the Romulans and how you liked, you know, you like the way you've grown up reading about them and like them and and know them. Uh, and and I do, I, I, the thing that I catch on to is it does kind of smack of that same old, Klingons are bad. Romulans are bad. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. To just say they finally came over to the good side, the Vulcan side. I, I, I'm fully with you that I would like to see some of the Romulan elements in this culture. Yeah. I, I think because you're just like, oh, man, they merged Navarre. Hell yeah. What, what are we going to do with that? And, oh, they, they're, they're just Vulcans. <laughs> right. And the, uh, the, the president of Navarre, is she Vulcan or Romulan? I don't remember. She's she got ridges. ridges. Yeah. She might be. So that's why, yeah. Both. She might but be. she definitely is a follower of Serac, uh, based mm. on her discussions in this episode. Yeah. So maybe, maybe some have conformed in that way and maybe some yeah, haven't. Sure. Absolutely. You, you, you kind of get the sense though that Vulcans, <laughs> if they were to allow a bunch of Romulan refugees, to come to Vulcan, it seems that they would only let the ones who were willing to conform to Serac. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at, at some, at least at the point we saw them last, now they may have grown and they may be willing to have more of a multicultural, diverse thing going on, but. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Man. I, yeah, I don't know. I just, you know, I've talked a lot about a lot of, a lot of the problem, my problems with discovery have been this sort of balance issue of, trying to have talked about it a lot, but trying to work on the overarching plot while trying to make each episode have a, have an arc. Mm -hmm. And I thought this episode is a great archetype for how you do it. Well, they had, they had multiple B plots that were kind of moving the, the checkerboard forward on the other plots, the gray plot, getting a body. Um, that was very, even though it was, it was a large event, it was very small in the, within the episode. The time it took wasn't very mm-hmm. much. Not, not a lot happened. Uh, and the same thing with the, uh, the DME as he, as he named it this episode. Um, but most of this episode was an A plot where Burnham is dealing with a single story that has a beginning, middle and end. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's what I, that's what I want to see from a Star Trek episode. I want a Star Trek episode to be an episode. And so, you know, chasing down this, 
you know, assassin nun Romulan who is trying to, you know, who's willing to kill for the right reasons. You know, that's, that's, yeah. that, that was fun for me. I really enjoyed it. And Burnham dealing with her mother and all the complex, um, dealings with Navarre and the Federation. And is it worth turning over this fugitive? This is almost the same conversation we had last season where was it worth, uh, imprisoning Osira or, or letting Osira off if it meant the Federation lived uh-huh. in this particular scenario, they made the opposite decision and it's just like, there's, there's those shades of gray, you know? Yeah. I feel like Starfleet should have like a policy. You know how, like when you work at like a <laughs> pizza place and they say, <laughs> Hey, if someone tries to rob you, let them don't get, <laughs> don't die. <laughs> Uh, right. I feel like right. if a Starfleet should have a similar policy, because she totally told that dude on the on the credence, please choose to live, and he was like, "Or I can grab this stick." Yeah, you're dead, dude. Sorry, she shouldn't even be thrown in jail. Like she was doing uh-huh. valiant work, man. She was saving a species from extinction. That's totally like the good of the many over the good of uh, or the good of the few, whatever. <laughs> the, the good of the many <laughs> over the good of the few. So, like, <clears throat> you know, she was clearly doing the right thing. And uh, for, you know, good reasons, because they wouldn't have, right. uh, you know, given her the the dilithium. I don't I don't think that's true. The reason they said she wouldn't do it, she wouldn't give her the dilithium unless she divulged. The thing is, Uh she, I think the Federation would have gladly helped her. Sure. If she'd gone to them, but she didn't trust the Federation. And that, and therein lies the problem. It's like the Federation at this point in history is not trusted the way it was, Mm -hmm. especially by a Kuat Malat devotee who's, who's ready to like kill anyone she needs to, to save this species. Like it's just, they need to earn her trust. And so that's what this was about. This turning her over to Navarre. And I mean, honestly, I think it, 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 you got what you're saying. Like they didn't imprison her. They turned her over to Navarre yeah. and Burnham says, will we see justice? And, and he's like, you know, eventually. And I, I don't, I don't think she's going to jail. Yeah. I think that they're going to turn her over to her people who will say you lived by our code. And that's what, you know, <laughs> That's okay with us. <laughs> As yep. they beam off, you're like, shit, you did good, girl. Look at that. <laughs> Basically, I mean, I mean, that's how we feel. But yeah. That's the thing is like Burnham, who would have made the same decisions this, this woman made at a different time in her life, you know? You mean like last week? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I do. I feel like Burnham is a, is sometimes a pretty inconsistent character. They all are from time to time. I do think that Burnham has grown more to respect the sort of rules of the Federation and like what, what those rules represent. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this series started with her, you know, causing the Klingon war because she disobeyed the rules and, and did a big bad thing. And so like she did a few other of those things. And this whole series has been about her learning that lesson of like, you know, Following the conductor's orders, as it were. Right. And and that's fine. It's just I also was sitting there going, like, I, I was shocked at the end of the episode where she was like, no, I want justice. So I'm like, oh, wait, you just like advocated for her like sentencing to be or for the, at, least, at the very least for her, uh, you know, noble motives to be considered when when forcing sentence you know and then you're like right yeah we'll do that she's going with them wait what i want blood like (laughs) (laughs) well i don't think she wanted blood i think she wanted like a reasonable sentence burnham wanted her pound of flesh sure (laughs) sure i think she wanted uh wanted the rules to be followed yeah and wanted the people in the federation to get what you know that she says it the family and that's what's so i love i love that every time she thinks she's going to say something that gets high and mighty uh, on the toward the president the president comes back at her and absolutely has a great answer right um i'm lo- i'm loving the president in the season you know she's um, all right she's 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 won me over by you know when when uh burnham starts uh, 
counting on her fingers all the family of this woman who's or this man who was killed and then she just immediately picks up and knows all the family members off the top of her head it's just really really good she's like i know that i just have to make a different decision because i'm worried about the next Navarian who wants to do this i want them to trust the federation enough to come to us so i'm gonna tr- i'm gonna respect their culture and so next time maybe they will come to us because we will be the federation who's worth trusting yeah i mean you know if you're trying to get these people in your federation, maybe you need to respect their culture anyway. Like, that, I mean, I can't believe she didn't know that that's what was going to happen. I knew that that's what was going to happen. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah. I don't, I, I don't think I did. I don't, I don't know that I. I thought it was very likely when she willingly puts the handcuffs on at the end. I was uh-huh. like, well, she's turning herself in. They may allow this to like. She may go to trial. She may get her, uh, you know, imprisoned or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, until they need a badass warrior next season. Uh, I I don't know. I, I I feel I feel that you're uh you're not you didn't love this episode, but I just I I really did. I I was really on board with this one. Yeah, I was pretty bored most of the time, but it was like the opposite way of why I was bored last time. It was <laughs> it was just like okay, the the pacing is really off this episode. Um, I don't like gray. I, I don't, right. the, the, I feel no chemistry between gray and Adira. Like, I just feel like they miscast gray as I like Adira. I just feel like they miscast gray and, and <laughs> remembering your statement last week uh, about how they've, they just keep making him this like smiling, angelic being. Um, yeah. <laughs> He, he did a whole lot of that this week. <laughs> yes, he did. I mean, he, he was in a ceremony where he was brought back to life. So at least this week it made sense. And I'm hopeful that mm. the, all of that angelic being stuff is going to lead us into a place where now Gray is real. And Gray starts making real person decisions and stops being just this emotional support ghost. <laughs> and like... <laughs> <laughs> and fully like embraces his own desires. And they were already talking about him going back and finishing off learning to be a guardian, which is not the course Adira is on. Right. And so like, they're going to be pushed apart and like Adira is not going to appreciate that, you know? So I, I, yeah. I really think, uh, I really think that like there's potential here that maybe all of that was on purpose. All that like perfect. It kind of like is the, you know, you know, you have a sense of a relationship that you want to happen mm-hmm. and you like, you imagine the person you want to be with and you, you know them, you get to know them. You're like, oh, they, they are this person. Then you actually date them and like, oh, this is different. This is not what I expected. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of can get a sense of like this sort of maybe sort of a, an, an, an allegory there, which I'm sure the admiral would love to lay out in all those fine words that he uses. He does get paid by the word. That was a lot of analogy. It was a really good intera- interaction between them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I did like the, that the, there was all these themes of paths and, and moving forward in your life and recognizing yeah. when, you know, a certain time had ended, a certain path had ended and it was time to choose life and choose another path. Um, yeah, that was I, my I liked favorite part of the episode. Loved it. it. It's an expansion of the Kuat Malat like whole thing. I love it. I love that there's, it's, it's, there's more to choose life than just those two words. And she explains it in such a beautiful way. And it like really hit me in the heart of like, there's times in your life where you just reach the end of a road and it's so hard to know. And it, the, the darkness that crossed her face when she says, yes, in regular life, it's much harder to know when a path has ended. Yeah. Mm. Hopefully this is the end of Tilly's adorable, awkward path. As she could get some confidence and move into another direction along another path. As man. I don't think she'll ever be non adorable, but I do think she's probably leaving the discovery. Go in peace. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, man, I love I'm just, her. I don't know. She's fine. I just, uh, you know, in the last couple episodes before this, they didn't do that with her. And I was fine. I was like, good. I'm, 
she seems a little more solemn, a little more uh, interested in and f- figuring out what's going on with her. And she, there's something wrong with her. She's got something going on. And uh, I'm all for like, hey, I need help. Something is different. But then, you know, they're all like, oh, she's got to get out of her comfort zone, which now means it, she's, it's time for her to be so obnoxious. <laughs> which is kind of played. I'm like, you're a lieutenant now. Get your shit together. Stop being so obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just get tired of the same old bits. And I think one of the, and I think this is what actually kind of soured me on the episode. And I know a lot of people say it and I normally just go, eh, whatever. I don't really notice it. Oh my God. The whispering this episode. I didn't know From the it. very beginning, like <clears throat> I couldn't hear it. Like Burnham is like whispering to freaking uh, Stamets in the in the engineering section. They're both like whispering, <laughs> and then she's talking to Book, and they're whispering. And I'm like, "What is happening? What? <laughs> like I can't hear." Anyway, my uh, I was I think I was just I just got in a bad mood. Like too many things in this episode, but <laughs> I, I like stuff about it. Yeah, I thought it was it was neat to expand on the role of the co-op a lot a little bit, and uh-huh. we already knew they had been brought forward to this time period, uh, which was you know especially this episode is very much you know so much connection to the Picard series. You know the fact that they are using the same body type, they're using this some android mm-hmm. type four or whatever we've got here, and then they're also um, you know connecting it with the co-op a lot. It's just interesting uh, that they're really building into the canon, these new things that Picard has introduced. Yeah, no, I thought, I think that's great. I th- wish it felt a little more organic, but at this point for me, it does really just kind of feel like, look at all these ties to Picard. <laughs> yeah. This episode, I mean, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. It's a common thing with a big universe spanning thing to have any connection feels like you're making the universe small. You know, Sometimes at the same time, though, if they don't do it, you're like, "Why don't they do that? They had that." Yeah. you know, exactly. And I, I, you know, making her mother a co-op a lot. I, uh, I have liked that quite a bit. Yeah, I, I think that, and that gives us the door to like, you know, yes, there's a co-op a lot on the ship in Picard, and now her mother is a co-op a lot. So it's like, there's just there's just going to be more of that on the show. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really. Or like that man until he talked about her mom. Yeah, uh, that was. I thought that was touching. Yeah, I. I got a little misty, especially when you've got Burnham. Burnham standing there with her mom, like they all decided to jump whatever ten thousand years in the future, and it's like. <laughs> <laughs> I know I always say it wrong. Nine hundred and thirty-three, thirty nine hundred thirty. All right. No, not ten thousand uh, years. Seven, seven million. I get it. Uh, so they jump 930 years <laughs> in the future and they all agree to leave their lives behind. And mm-hmm. yeah, there's gotta be a little bit of jealousy there in the, in that story she's telling about like how she, if she just had her mom here, she'd give her a hug, but, and she's trying to convince them to like cool it. But also like, there's gotta be a little bit of heartfelt, like it's hard. She left her mom and, and burn her, and, and they kind of all like, it's almost like they had this like, you know, we're all going to hold hands and step into the future where all our families are dead. Oh, except Burnham gets her mom back and everyone uh, else has yeah. to deal. Of course she does. Yeah. The speech was good. And then the context of the speech with Burnham's mom sitting there was, was it d- drove the point home. Yeah. I liked it. We all, we lose everything by going 930 years in the future, except for Burnham who gains her mom and some Foxy Dick. I mean, indeed. I mean, indeed. What, what are we gonna? I mean, how we? How are we not gonna say that? I mean, look, look at book <laughs> specimen. <laughs> um. All right. Well, guys. So I, sorry, that line from uh, Civil War always makes me laugh. No, uh, Winter Soldier. When that like Mac store employee just looks at <laughs> looks at uh, Chris Evans and goes specimen. <laughs> Ah, uh, well, yeah, I didn't pick it up because I've only seen that like once. <laughs> ah. Good, good line. Good line. Well, what movie was it from? 
Winter Soldier. You're talking about the movie, right? That was a movie, yes. Yeah, okay. I've seen that one like three or four times, because that was the best one out of all of them. Yeah, yeah, it's really it's really good. I know a lot of people think that, uh, you know, I, I did like it a lot. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think, because I'm pretty sure, sh- I feel like there was something else I wanted to say, but I don't, I don't Anything remember. Anything about the book storyline? We didn't really get into it much. Uh, you know, that was kind of, that was fine. Uh, you know, honestly, I felt like this episode in some ways just felt like filler and I am a little disappointed in that too. Like they're like basically Stamets went and said, Hey, I think it's this thing. And the Vulcans said, no, it's not. (laughs) And that was it. That that was uh, cool. (laughs) It's such a catch 22 that they find themselves in, in these situations, because like if you don't touch on storylines a little bit, you get this weird problem. Any, the balance between how much of the cast, need, how much of each storyline needs to get in each episode? You know what I mean? Yeah, is so such a hard balance to strike because I hear you. I, I know it is. I'm like, nothing happened really with the DME this episode except it got a name, um, and it's still a mystery. Like, and it was a mystery last episode. Nothing changed. DMA, I believe it was. Oh, it's anomaly, not entity. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But if they don't talk about it at all, then what are they? You know, what are they even doing? Um, I, I, you know, I, I probably would have been fine if they just like left that whole trip. To, well, they, they also wanted to go to Vulcan so that, um, uh, they could have that experience for book. So yeah. I guess that was part of the, part of the thrust there from a writing perspective. This is a, again, one of those situations where I feel like th- that whole storyline would have been like, in the briefing room on TNG. Yeah, no, no. I was going to say it would have been, uh, this whole episode was Jordy had a algorithm running in the background or whatever. And like, Oh, the algorithm finished. It turns out it's not that back to the drawing board. You know, yeah. like, and then they just focus on what they want to focus on. And Stamets, I guess, yes, it goes along with he's on one path and he has to recognize that path is over. He has to choose to live and move on and try to figure out what the hell this thing is. Cool. Yeah, you can force it into the theme. Yeah, I wouldn't have even drawn that connection. But to me, it was just like, huh, it looks like this, except there's not this. And it has to have that for it to be what I think it is. So I guess it can't be that. Let me go take it to the Navarre Science Council. And then they're all like, hey, it's not that because it doesn't have the thing that you said that it doesn't have. And you were right about that. And they yeah. he was like, no. I like I said, I I don't mind it. I thought it was a pretty good balance because yeah. those elements were not um, very heavy in t- the amount of time they spent on them. Between those, they they really split up the B storyline into three different B storylines: Gray, Stamets, and Book. And like, mm-hmm. I didn't think those even any any of those three got too much screen time. I was I was pretty happy that like the A plot felt to me, and I may be wrong. I could go analyze it, but it felt to me like the A storyline was the story of this episode and the rest were very deliberately pushed into the background, which I enjoyed. No. Um, so, so much of these like waiting decisions about how many characters to follow in a given episode, how much of which storyline to balance is <clears throat> all about choosing, choosing to let something slip. Um, but, but then again, you know, if they just not touched on it at all, not, not showed us that three episodes for two episodes, let's say, then when we come back to it, we're like, what's the DMA? Oh, right. They're doing the thing with the wormhole. Mm -hmm. Everything in this episode, except for Michael's storyline feels like it would have been like a line to catch us up with the characters in an episode of Voyager. And I don't necessarily say that to, to, to dig discovery. Uh, it may have been a dig at Voyager or TNG or whatever. Um, but I do feel like that's what they would have done. They would have been like, well, he went to the, he talked to the science council and they concurred with his findings that it's not the thing. And then book would have been like, you know, thankfully I was able to, you know, come to some peace with, with what happened after I did a Vulcan mind meld. And, and then like gray yeah. would have come up to the bridge and they're like, it was touch and go for a while, but, Gray's finally back because I mean we <laughs> we knew that Gray wasn't gonna die. Yeah, not at this point in the season. Yeah, that was a long while of fake drama because we knew they were gonna kill Gray. So right. 
some of that could have, you know, gone away and just they. Uh, it felt like they were killing time, and it, it, it annoys me because we know they're not going to kill Gray. I don't think that's the case. <laughs> I think with the DMA, maybe a little bit, but I, I think they were trying to build characters and trying to focus on themes. Like the the thing with Gray was supposed to be about them learning the lesson that like mm-hmm. Adira needed to call call him out, or like sometimes yeah. when we're in a dark place, we need someone to call us through it. Uh, right. We need someone to try to connect with us. Connecting to people is important. Like that's, that's some a, CW that's a great, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't agree. I think that's some that's some good shit. Um, and then also you've got um, book still trying reeling from the death of his world and right. trying to process it. And so I think that's that's really what the whole visit to Nav- Navarre did. Was mm-hmm. push book storyline forward. I agree. The, the, the Stamet stuff with the DMA, that was just a device to get book to where he could have that interaction with the, um, Navarian, uh, whatever president. Yeah. When she mind melds with book, I actually thought it was like quite beautiful. The look on her face when she's, cause she has just experienced his loss and like mm-hmm. she's trying to hold together her own reaction. And, and, and book steps away and she says, my condolences would mean nothing. You know, like right. she, she really does understand what book is going through. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I like that a lot. Yeah, that was, that was pretty good. Um, I, I, I you know, <laughs> I know it sounds like I just hate discovery now. <laughs> and it's not the case. It's just sort of making some questionable decisions for me with, with how they're executing. Uh, the storyline rolling out. Yeah, I hear you. I thought this one was a well balanced episode. I like new Star Trek. I like, you know, Paramount Plus's Star Trek. I'm sure there are people like, this guy's just a piece of shit who doesn't like new stuff. No, that's not that. Right. No, man, it's fine if you don't, if you don't feel the same way and don't like an episode, but you know, I just thought this one was well balanced. Um, unlike some of them, some of them feel very unbalanced. I thought this one was one that worked. Okay. Well, I'm glad you liked it, man. I I was just bored. Well, thank you. I'm sorry you were bored. I did like the swords. Uh, yeah, sword, yeah. The sword fighting was fun. It was brutal when she killed her sister or whatever. That was rough. Yeah, it was unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, what are you doing, it, lady? It did seem. And so the Quat Malat, they like swear themselves to a cause and that just becomes their master. There's not like, it's not like they, answer to the other Kuat Malats, except at the tip of a sword, which I think is super interesting to a culture. Like you're, you know, you decide what your right thing to do is. You find your lost cause. You fight for it as hard as you can. And like, we're not going to judge you harshly if that, if you, if you're doing the thing you're supposed to be doing, but we, we, we may come fight you if we have to. Like that's, Mm -hmm. that's interesting. It's a really interesting, uh, way of being. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, the, they've definitely turned the Kuat Malat into a really cool, uh, which they were already always pretty cool, but, um, I'm really starting to feel like they are the next, like, Klingon Empire type of, like, iconic Star, Star Trek villain or, uh, sect. I find them fascinating for sure. I, I think they're really, really cool. Um, and, and like you said, they've been cool all along ever since, um, you know, ever since uh, we first met them in Picard, I was really, really on board. Just, just cool. They're just cool. You know, these swordsmen that say choose life. Like that, that line from that very first episode is like, yeah, mm-hmm. you better choose life, buddy. It's really Which good. Which I, I guess like the, the Klingons didn't get really super popular until they were actually the, al- the allies of the Federation in, in TNG because that sort of like Japanese inspired version of the Klingons really that, that TNG brought about was, was the one that got really popular. Like the, the stuff from the original series when they were like Soviet union didn't seem to catch on quite as much. Yeah, for sure. I think that like people connect with them once they, once the the show stopped treating them as just pure antagonists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> It Plus, seems to, uh, you know, it seems to track, it seems to track pretty well. Before they were just kind of like weirdly balding 
pudgy guys in vests. Yeah. Who likes those? As I look in the mirror here at my vest. <laughs> and then they became like these like super tall, muscular warriors who were obsessed with honor. <laughs> Can't imagine why they suddenly got popular. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like, too, they were a lot more treacherous in the old uh, original series. Like, it seemed like they were tricksters a little more, which is not who they are in a, in TNG era at all. Oh, I mean, well, I think there are just as many treacherous trickster Klingons in TNG. They, they're there, but it's frowned upon. <laughs> yeah, it's frowned upon a little more. <laughs> all right, well, man... It's been fun. Thank you so much for doing the Star Trek podcast with me. I I know I know it's not always fun when you don't enjoy the episode, but I uh, I, had a, I had a good time with this one. Um, but uh, you guys, write in. Tell us what you thought of this episode. Tell us what you think of the upcoming episodes. We'd love to have some uh, some feedback to read on the end of these things. Um, get you get your uh, perspective on what's going on. It's discovery or any of this stuff. Uh, but otherwise, we are the Star Trek universe. Hit, hit us up wherever. <laughs> Star Trek Ucast at gmail.com, I think is the, uh, is the, is the email. Joel on True, which finally got said again this episode. Mm hmm. Live long and prosper. Thank you for listening to the Star Trek Universe Podcast, a Stranded Panda production. If you'd like to hear more from David C. Robertson, check out the DC On Screen Podcast or maladjusted.tv for his web videos. If you'd like to hear more from Matthew Carroll, check out the Marvel Cinematic Universe Podcast or listen to his music. Just search for Matthew Carroll anywhere you get music. 